The original Shinmu on Dreamcast debuted in Japan on December 29th, 1999. It was, in other words, a Y2K game. But within just two years, the attacks of 9-11 would upend everything about so-called global culture that Shinmu set out to exemplify. Even as far back as Y2K, Yu Suzuki's trilogy may have already been planned, but after 9-11, its fate was already sealed. Though we'll talk a lot in the next few minutes about Shinmu as a product of Asia, really from the ground up, it was created to be a global sensation. The failure for it to actually do so, I claim, has to do with a myriad of factors. Centrally, the appalling English voice acting, at a time when dubbed Japanese couldn't fit onto the same disc. But another, more indirect explanation may involve 9-11 insofar as the attacks all but permanently destroyed the average American consumer's open-mindedness to culture from foreign places, especially from what is maybe no longer called, but still arguably thought of as the Orient, the East. And now that the cultural more is you have your little box and I have mine, it's hard to see how a cultural fusion-heavy game like Shinmu could have ever stood a chance. All in all, Shinmu is neither successful in the West or in Japan. This, I contend, at the very least, may have to do with the post-9-11 growth all around the world of insularity. The newest entry's failure at home is more complex, given the cultural preference by Japan for handheld platforms like the Nintendo Switch. There's also the fact that the game debuted during a particularly busy season. It may not be Western enough to qualify as a good game to critics here, nor Japanese enough to be even widely played there. But as much as it takes flack for being supposedly quaint and obsolete, Shinmu's always had its eye on the future. It's just a future that never really materialized. At long last, Yu Suzuki's Shinmu trilogy is complete. 20 years stand between the debut of the Dreamcast original and the recent PS4 and Windows release. As a fan of the series, since playing the sequel on Xbox back in 2002, I can say it's been well worth the wait. But sadly, Shinmu's never been a success on par with its rivals. Neither critically nor commercially has the series ever performed well in the English-speaking world. This is a video about why that may be, and ultimately why Shinmu's different, if not better, than many seem to recognize. Shinmu is the brainchild of Yu Suzuki, a legendary developer originally from Sega. Suzuki created a Beatles-level perfect run of arcade titles in the 80s and early 90s, including such classics as Afterburner, Space Harrier, and the Virtua series. With Virtua Racing and Virtua Fighter, Suzuki brought real-time 3D rendering into video games for the first time. Throughout his early career, Suzuki worked to revolutionize a form of video game realism that went on to change the entire medium forever. In many respects, the original Shenmu was the culmination of Suzuki's quest for the ultimate realism. But it's already, we've run into the real reason Shenmu's never succeeded abroad. Namely, the question of culture. Nowadays, it seems critics and non-professionals alike tend to forget that, well, different cultures exist. Yet this has been a difficulty going back all the way to the start of this industry. When Japan picked up the pieces in the aftermath of Atari's 1983 crash, Saving the games industry also reoriented it towards Asian culture, so to speak. A phrase I use here for brevity's sake, but is nonetheless fraught with issues, as we'll see by the end. Shenmue tried to buck Nintendo's influential strategy of pretending to be Western. There's no New York plumber or European knight in this game. Shenmue's original sin may have been being unapologetically Asian to be clear, the series doesn't try to alienate the so-called West. We can see this in lots of different ways, including the fact that one of its underlying conceits is hard-boiled detective fiction. The Shinmu Saga is one long investigation into who killed the father of your protagonist. But there are a number of ingredients in the Shinmu stew, if you will, we in the English-speaking world 
largely consider ourselves proud not to know or care about. Shinmu builds off Japanese and Chinese cultural forms, which you'd have to familiarize yourself with to understand. First is, of course, Kung Fu. When Yu Suzuki was coming up in the 80s, Hong Kong cinema was all the rage. The influence of Hong Kong cinema on Shinmu is readily apparent from everything from the music to, of course, the martial arts. Yet, even if many of us here in the West know the names of, say, Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee, what we may not realize is that Kung Fu is about a lot more than just combat. It's a spiritual and philosophical pastime that's been handed down all the way from ancient China. Playing Shinmu takes learning the wisdom of Eastern thought along with our young protagonist, Ryo Hazuki. Like him at the start, many will feel restless at first, if not bored. But you need to stay with it to really experience what Shinmu's about. The Shinmu games express their martial philosophy through a unified sense of balance. Fighting is only one, if not one, important element here. Because really, Shinmu's about what makes life worth fighting for, as well as advancing the medium beyond what we've seen before. This brings us to the second Asian cultural form at play, the slice of life and visual novel Japanese genres. Shinmu tried to buck the perpetual trend of video game violence somewhat, and this is another big turnoff, perhaps, for many of us in the West. In Shinmu, you spend time talking to kids and old people, or working a job. These sim elements work together with the series' notorious attention to detail to deliver a further degree of pseudo-realism than many may find enjoyable. But that brings up another thing that we may not understand here in the West. Shinmu is also part of a Japanese tradition of being unspoken. As Japanese Today writes, many Japanese communicate via silence. <laughs> and in video games, this cultural mode often finds expression in concealing mechanics. Take Yuji Horii's innovative 1983 game, The Portopia Serial Murder Case. This game, much like Shinmu, tasks you with solving a murder, but completely stays silent as to how, only by quietly accepting your burden and sincerely deliberating how to use its mechanics can you reach the end. Most of us Westerners would immediately quit a game like Portopia out of frustration or boredom. But in a heavily regimented Japan where the individual arguably rarely gets to feel important or in control, a game that silently follows your lead has a different meaning. There's also the question of Asia as an idea. In the so-called West, there's always been a tendency to think of the East as one thing. Edward Said's landmark 1978 work Orientalism points this out. Although we might call a Chinese-American and a Japanese-American both Asian-American, in reality Asia is at best a nebulous, if not controversial, concept for the so-called Asians. What might be confusing here is that Shinmu undoubtedly does try to establish some sort of pan-Asiatic identity. But the history between China and Japan is somewhat comparable to England and France, their long-term bitter rivals, who only relatively recently stopped trying to kill each other. Yet they also share a great deal in common. Shinmu seems to set out to ease tensions between Japan and China insofar as it's an epic that spans both countries. Culminating with Shinmu 3, the series introduces players to the beauty of China's history, its peoples, and its lands, even if it's a pre-communist China. We Westerners get doubly blessed in this regard. The trilogy often can feel like a virtual vacation, taking us from Yokosuka, a real-life town in Japan where Ryo is from, to Hong Kong in Shinmu 2, and then finally in Shinmu 3, Quail in China. As much as Shinmu is culturally Japanese, with elements from visual novels and slice of life, as a kung fu revenge epic, the saga is paying homage to a tradition of Chinese revenge tales going back at least to The Orphan of Zhao, a play written in China during the 13th century. Shinmu was in some sense the 21st century's original open world game. And though later PS2 era titles such as Yakuza or Persona would build off its foundation, arguably no open world game or series has committed to the conceit of pseudo-realism more. You know how in GTA games since 2001, you can find a ton of stuff to do outside missions? 
or how modern open world games try to feel like entire virtual vacations with plenty of activities and secrets to discover while exploring on your own, missable content and hidden mechanics. Arguably, Shinmu revolutionized these approaches. The thing about Shinmu as an open world series is getting the most out of it requires you to think of it as an entire miniature society. What some people find annoying is how these games make you wait before progressing. What this completely misunderstands is the reason. You're gated off from the next main story event purposefully to give you free time within the world of the game. It's a so-called social simulation game, meaning you'll be expected as Ryo Hazuki to try and live a full life in addition to solving the murder of your father. Do you spend that downtime earning money, working on your kung fu, or following up on a lead in your investigation? Shinmu can kind of both be an RPG and an adventure game. It's hybridizing a lot of different elements together at once. The more you play, the more Ryo becomes a reflection of your adventure. If you just stick to doing what you're explicitly told to do next, you're depriving yourself of a lot of the non-linearity and open-endedness, and ultimately, the things that make this series great. One reason Shinmu 1 and 2 weren't really big hits in English was probably because they had some of the worst voice acting ever. If possible, try to play an undubbed version with the original audio. If you do, you'll be surprised at what you find. If you can imagine David Lynch's Twin Peaks without much surrealism, that's close to what you get with Shinmu. What I mean is that on the surface, what looks to be a normal functioning town or society actually has layers hiding underneath. Playing through the trilogy is like descending the strata of society until you reach a truth that's been hidden at the very bottom. You never know where a clue or lead might appear from, so it pays to be alert and think outside the box. Another great thing about Shinmu is that there are usually multiple different ways to obtain the right information about how to proceed. Even if this is an incredibly scripted game in a lot of respects, with a lot of ambition to be cinematic, Shinmu's approach to non-linearity is impressive, not only for its time, but even for now. Shinmu 3 has brought the series back to its roots, while providing a sort of pastoralism that really reminds me of Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. If you enjoyed fishing or doing side quests in that game, you'll probably love Shinmu 3. For all these cultural explanations and cases of things getting lost in translation, Shinmu is a much better series than it gets credit for. I'm working my way through Shinmu 3, and I'll post a review once I'm done. Until next time, boss.